Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Police Foundation for organising this event. Uh, and I've managed to be here for this afternoon, and I'm very grateful for the speakers uh, that I've already learnt from uh, today. I spoke at an event uh, last week where the audience were given a choice between going to the toilet or staying and listening to me. Uh, and I'm very glad that you haven't been put in such a difficult position as to make that, uh, have to make that decision. Um, I'm very lucky to be the first CEO of the College of Policing. Um, it is a professional body for policing. We haven't had a professional body for policing uh, in this way before. And uh, unfortunately, we can't find another one anywhere else in the world to go and copy. So we are building and designing and delivering uh, at the same time. So what are we responsible for? Well, we set the standards for policing uh, in England and Wales. We are responsible for building the evidence base for policing. We have to promote ethics and integrity. Um, we have responsibility for helping police forces work together and work outside policing with other organisations, support organisations, third sector, other public sector uh, bodies. And we set the education and learning requirement for those who work in policing. So that's our five objectives. But another way to look at it is to think about uh, what do all serious professions tend to have in common? And I'll probably use these four areas uh, as I talk about uh, how domestic abuse really epitomises the importance of policing developing as a profession. Well, all the serious professions for a start, work from a body of knowledge or an evidence base, which fits very well with one of our responsibilities, and I will come to the use of evidence shortly. All serious professions uh, work from a code of ethics or a code of conduct, and we have published a code of ethics for the police service uh, a few months ago, and in fact, we have laid that, uh, that's been laid in Parliament as a code of practice, which gives it a higher status, which means chief constables must have regard to it. And in setting standards, and I think this is interesting in the context of domestic abuse, in effect there are three levels that we can set these standards at. We can publish best practice and describe something that appears to work really well in a number of places and let everybody know where you'd go and look at it and how you might replicate what is already going on or we publish something called authorised professional practice. Of course, it's the police. We have to reduce everything to three letters. So that becomes APP. In effect, they are the standards published in policing. Or at the highest level, we now have the power in the legislation that created us to ask the Home Secretary to lay codes of practice uh, in Parliament. Other professions have continuous professional development. There is no sustained tradition in policing of continuous professional development. And if you just think of that again in the context of domestic abuse and all we have learned over the years and some of the debates today and the conversations about identifying coercive control and our better understanding of what goes on in a relationship well beyond the immediate crisis that might be the emergency that the police are called to, not having continuous professional development, not having an expectation in policing that everyone will update their skills and knowledge and understand the latest guidance every year is a real weakness and something uh, we are working on. And then the fourth area is around licensing and accreditation. All other serious professions are very clear indeed about what people in that profession are accredited or licensed or qualified to do. And in policing, we do that really, really well in some areas. Uh, police use of firearms might be a good example that uh, you wouldn't expect, well, it just would not happen that anyone in policing would touch a police firearm unless they had completed all the qualifications, done all their CPD, passed all the exams, done all their requalifications, et cetera, et cetera. You could say the same about public order. You couldn't say the same about child abuse. And you couldn't say the same about domestic abuse. And I think that's a very interesting position we've got into in terms of the licensing and accreditation of the people who work in policing. Now, we could start perhaps by saying, if people aren't doing their job properly, then why don't we just get rid of them? And in fact, I'd start further back. Uh, who are we recruiting? How are we recruiting? What standards are we looking for? What 
characteristics are we looking for? What attitude, what culture, what temperament are we looking for? And in the college, we own the entry requirements into policing. We set the standards for those requirements and we are now asking ourselves some very serious questions about whether we are looking for the right things in who we recruit into policing. We recruit endless numbers of brilliant people who work really hard and are very, very good at what they do. But we also know in policing, we've let people through the door who are bad to be in policing, who don't support victims, who have entirely the wrong attitude and culture. And those very small in number but high impact people uh, damage us all. But you could say it's about supervision, it's about behaviour, just tell everyone what to do, make them do it, and have a sanction if they don't do what you've told them. Well, the evidence, and we try and work from evidence in the college, shows that that's the approach to take when you've kind of run out of ideas and you haven't used the better approaches. So absolutely it's valid if someone is, is wrong, and if someone isn't doing their job properly, and they're not following what they've been told to do, then by all means use sanctions. Much, much better much more longer lasting and sustained in terms of improvement is to allow people to understand, to invest in them, so they do understand why they're doing something and they're able to question it and they're able to challenge in an adult way and therefore in an informed position when they take their actions, for example, in protecting a victim of crime or pursuing a perpetrator, they know the reasons for what they're doing and they're not doing it because they'll get in trouble if it goes wrong. Discretion is a uh, very big issue in policing, so I'll take, take us back to the Code of Ethics. The Code of Ethics, for those who are not familiar with it, is a perfectly good read. Uh, it doesn't take very long to read, um, and it sets out how one might, in policing, approach a difficult decision, a dilemma you're in, uh, and it's a document to use to guide you to make sensible decisions that stick to principles and standards. That Code of Ethics, just in itself, sets the tone for dealing with tackling domestic abuse. And merely following the code of ethics without anything else would make sure that people were respectful, investigated properly, arrested when they needed to, and conducted a thorough investigation, taking a case to court uh, if necessary. Moving then to the evidence base, um, there is lots going on at the moment to develop the evidence base uh, in this area. And in an ideal world, we would build the evidence, and then we would set the standard, and then we would do the education. Unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world, and we can't just wait for another couple of years for all the evidence to be in place so we can move in that lovely sequence. However, we do need to strengthen the evidence base in this area, and areas that we are looking at at the moment uh, include the work of using body-worn video. So the use of body-worn video in Essex is a randomised control trial that has been completed and we will report on that tomorrow. And that particularly looks at the use of body-worn video in tackling domestic abuse and in taking a case to a charge that will then go to court and how effective will body-worn video be in doing that. It also looks at issues such as how easy is it to use the camera, can you really see the pictures, what about turning it on and off, what about privacy and all the other issues that come with the use of that equipment. For those of you who missed the last session with Andy and Levin, it was really, really good. I'm sure you made a good choice in the session you went for, but you really did miss an excellent session uh, with two of my uh, good people from the college. And they went through the really, really thorough review of uh, risk, assessment, risk assessments um, and the tools in identifying and assessing risk that are used around the world and they've looked at hundreds of examples, and they gave a very good uh, description of the key aspects in uh, those risk assessments. I think when asked how long do they need to make that evidence perfect and to bring it in everywhere, they said they'd like another 18 months. I felt like shouting from the back of the room, you haven't got 18 months, we'll have to be quicker. But it does illustrate, in some ways, the tension between carefully and thoroughly building the evidence and the need to change and improve now uh, and protect people who deserve to be protected by us. But that's a very good piece of research. Looks at what does it mean to use DASH, what are the other models that are available, what are the key issues we should be looking for, and how do we hone that in for frontline people to make sure 
they make a well-informed decision in the context that they find themselves understanding the relationship history, not just the crisis that they're dealing with at the time. And then working with our academic partners in our What Works Centre, um, we are conducting a systematic review of the criminal justice interventions and which ones are most successful. That review is due to report in December uh, this year. I mentioned continuous professional development as one of those four pillars or four aspects of other serious professions. Uh, and we are changing the curriculum for policing to make sure that it includes uh, domestic abuse and understanding of domestic abuse and the right approaches to take. We are changing the training uh, in this area and the training standards that are set uh, nationally. In understanding um, the evidence, we need the practitioners to take part. And to build the evidence, we need the practitioners in policing to take part in contributing to it. So I've talked about the areas where we are doing research. We're working with the universities. We're working with the What Works Centre. We also work across the other What Works Centres, NICE being an example, an early intervention. But other good professions, the practitioners, contribute to their evidence base. And there's been... Uh, understandably limited number of examples in practitioners contributing to the evidence base in this area. It is high risk. You have to get lots of permissions before you can proceed. You have to make sure you don't put people at risk uh, when you do it. But there is an example, uh, and my successors in Hampshire uh, have been conducting uh, a study where cases where a caution would otherwise have been given, there is an intervention with the perpetrator and there, there is now uh, an evaluation of the success or otherwise uh, of those uh, interventions with the perpetrator. I talked about um, working in partnership and the need for police forces to work between each other and across boundaries. And as the What Works Centre for Crime Reduction, we work with NICE and the Early Intervention Foundation and look for common factors uh, in this area that might help us along. Um, they identify the need for integrated care for victims, perpetrators and their children. They also highlighted that early intervention, health and social care professionals um, about how they can ask uh, and respond to, to domestic abuse, and making sure that we link up our evidence bases uh, between what is being learnt in health, what's being learnt in early, uh, early years, and what's being learnt uh, in, the, in the College of Policing. So, we are at a position where um, if you take the HMI's review, for example, of how domestic abuse is currently being dealt with, there are many failings. There are failings individually, there are failings with consistency, and there are failings in understanding, and there are real problems with culture. But at the same time, I think we've seen a transformation in the way that domestic abuse has been dealt with over recent years, and you have many, many hard-working professionals doing their very best uh, to protect victims, to catch perpetrators, and to prevent a repeat of domestic abuse. And my role with the college, really, is to invest in those practitioners, go back to those aspects of being a serious professional, make sure that people can work to a code of ethics when they're in a difficult position and they're making difficult decisions, make sure we provide them with the evidence base, not just it sits in the college, but instant access to that evidence when they need it to support people uh, when they are dealing with a crisis, make sure that we do introduce in policing continuous professional development that is currently not there in the way that it needs to be and that domestic abuse is one of those key elements in the curriculum that is constantly reinforced in continuous professional development and we don't have people who have had no training investment in five or ten years. And we need to think carefully about the licensing, accreditation and the specialisations in this area and how we should approach that in policing. Should we be asking the same questions that we asked in firearms and public order? Should people have a special qualification that they have to maintain? And even if you introduce that higher level of accreditation, 
the person answering the emergency call is most likely to be a relatively new in service person working on a shift three o'clock in the morning and it's the quality of their decision making at the scene that will set off either the right course of action to protect a victim of violence and to pursue a perpetrator or we'll end up with the wrong course of action. So much to do, um, progress being made, evidence base being built, um, some of those aspects of a profession being introduced. It won't all happen at once, it won't all happen at the same time and we very firmly take the view that the answers to all those questions don't come from just within policing, they come from outside policing as well. And an example of that will be in reviewing our standards and our training materials for domestic abuse. We are working with CADA, somebody from CADA who's in the audience today, um, is seconded to us for a period to challenge us and to bring to bear their knowledge from outside policing uh, around what those standards should contain and what the most effective forms of evidence are. And of course, we're not only working with CADA, we will work with many uh, charities, support organisations, third sector organisations who have expertise uh, in this area. Um, I will pause there and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.